foundation water users are water users who purchase water pre-financial close or commit to purchasing water pre-financial close. So whether that number is 40 million cubic metres or 65 million cubic metres, um, everyone, is a found, everyone there is a foundation water user. Um, and there are people within this agreement who are currently deep groundwater users and get the kind of terms that we've been, we've been talking about. Um, we are in the process of making some modest variations to the form of the agreement. Uh, because uh, as currently drafted, it, it envisages only two parties, um, a landowner who is irrigating on their own farm um, and us. So we need to have a variation of this where there's a leaseholder as an additional counterparty. But that doesn't vary the substantive terms. Um, and part of, the, uh, part of the agreement is essentially a promise that um, no, no later user gets better terms and conditions than foundation water users. Um, we will need a somewhat different agreement, um, again, pr presumably for uh, the uh, District Council water supply, uh, but again, not, f not fundamentally different, uh, reflecting the nature of the parties and their purpose of use, because clearly they, they don't need to be bound by the um, land use conditions, for example. So there are some minor variations. Uh, that need to reflect, you know, the various counterparties. But the substantive terms of the agreement won't change. I guess my question is if I, if I uh, show up in town five years from now and want to buy into this, the deal could be, could be different. significantly different, correct? It could be different, but it won't be better. Could there be incentives provided to me outside the pricing mechanism of the water user agreement? To sign up? That's a question, I guess, for the, uh, for the RWLP at some later date. We haven't uh, particularly turned our mind to that. But um, it's not, uh, we've, we've, we believe that the fundamentals of this agreement um, will remain, um, and anything that substantially departs from this, or departs in a way that's not, uh, can, not appropriate to the that's right. protocol rules that are set out in the concession deed well, wouldn't be possible. The concession deed governs the rules around protocols and the nature of these kinds of contracts. Well, and that is, a, that is a deed between the council and the RWLP. Well, stop me if I'm straying into an area that I shouldn't, but at some point uh, I saw a list of possible options if water uptake were not meeting the uh, projected levels uh, and this was becoming a, uh, a financial issue for the project and there was a listing of seven or eight uh, different measures that could be taken including adjusting the price including a variety of other things so we going into this have no real uh, there's, there's no real certainty as to when, if, or how such measures might need to be taken and what their financial implications would be if they were taken. Is that true? If you've seen such a list, you have not seen it from HBRIC. I think I know where you've seen it. It's, okay. <laughs> it's in you. It's, <laughs> it's right around the corner. I think you've seen it in uh, Deloitte's advice to you. Other questions? <coughs> you got another question? Yes. Um, we, we're just about ready to move into the money, actually, but I think we've thrashed this out. Okay. Well, this is this is an, um, we received a report earlier today from staff yep. on current work streams, and I don't yep. know if you were sitting at the back of the yeah, time. Yeah, I was. Yeah. Okay. I was going to yep. ask if you wanted to ask. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. So look, just yep. for the sake of clarity, I'll yep. read. I'll read what our report says. Yep. Uh, Ruatana far tranche to water exceeding the 15 minute cubic metre annual volume limit currently on hold. That's the application from HBRIC and Bostocks for that water. HBRIC has advised they have an MOU with the River Tanafar water users group. Um, so I'm not clear what this MOU might consist of and why that's put this application on hold. And I don't know anything about the River Tanafar water users group and how many of the current consent holders it might or might not represent. Yeah, so, so quickly, I'll answer your last question first, 
um, Councillor Bevan, but uh, around about 80 per cent of the current water users are members of the Ruritan of Water User Group. Um, so it picks up about 80 per cent of the consent of water uh, and virtually every major irrigator. The MOU that we have with the uh, user group essentially set up, it's just set up, set up a process around the consent application uh, and we've been through that process uh, over the last, um, oh, it's probably about the last six weeks, two months, um, with a nominated group from the user group, uh, effectively working with members of my team. I've, I've been involved in one or two of those discussions. And I, I think we're, we're all but at the point of reaching a, an agreement between both the user group and ourselves as to, as to how that consent might be framed. Um, and I, look, I think um, as, soon as, as soon as we've got that last but bolted down, I think that it'd be quite appropriate that we inform the council of where that sits, because it'll have to go back into a consenting process anyway, so it'll hit the public domain. Um, but it's probably worth giving you a little bit of extra flavour um, around how that's that's shaping out, um, because it's, it tells an interesting story actually. Um, without going into the whys and wherefores of where the board ended up with that, that particular decision, um, in reality, once you get down to is there any additional groundwater to be abstracted and pumped in the rear tap, because it's primary to place the rear tap of the basin, the only part of the basin that might have some potential for that is what we call zone A, so that's up around, to, uh, up around the Tiko, Tiko Kino <coughs> area. That's the only area. Um, in actual fact, so the window of opportunity for any additional groundwater, putting aside all the environmental obligations and you name it, which are not insignificant and quite complex, is that area there. So the actual market, if you like, for that water is, is extremely narrow. Um, and what's happened is that as a consequence of working this through with a user group, with, with effectively their membership and their membership's interest in that water is, is boiled down to probably about five current irrigators, in actual fact, because it's not easy to get. The obligations are stiff, um, but, it, but it does have potentially some value in, in three ways, really. Uh, it has, has some, the water has some value in terms of reliability of the scheme in conjunction with the irrigators. It has, it has some value in terms of po possibly just being able to pick up irrigation zones further outside the footprint, further north. Uh, where it's difficult to get pipes and pumps to, and where there's a capital cost. Uh, and, um, but overlaying all of that, um, from our point of view, we've done a lot of work on this, is, is that the impact, the impact of abstracting that water on service water flows has to be really carefully managed. Not easy. And the underlying principle, I think it's fair to say, Chairman, has been that, has been that, that we, we have judged that threshold for supplementary flows in the, in the water body uh, as, as, um, as being the first and foremost point we had to sort it out. And so that's a long-winded way of saying that, that if any of that water is utilised, there'll, there'll be a fair supplementation probably off the scheme of the surface water bodies. Um, but we're just about there with it. And the reason why I don't want to just get and tell you exactly what it is is because I've have, we have one process step left with the user group. Okay. Councillor Scott. The question around that, you said existing irrigators. I can think of one bore around there that has not yet oh, yes, yes, conceded yeah, yeah. so potential. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I think I know the one you're talking about. Mm. Yep. Maybe yes, it does. Consent holders. Uh, he, he, yeah, that's a bore that doesn't have a con it's, it's not consent. Mm. It's not consented, but it does exist. Mm. Yes. Yep. Quick question. Uh, of the water that's being used now for irrigation, what proportion is coming from uh, deep wells versus takes out of the oh, waterway. Two, 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 around about two thirds, two thirds deep groundwater, one third surface water, mm. roughly. That, that, that ratio may have changed slightly with the plan change over. I'd have to go back and see the numbers. Yep. I think we should get into the numbers. So that is the, uh, yep. the extra, the next piece, unless um, there are other questions. Pete. Um, the HBRIC Limited financial report set out in Table 1 on page 59 of the agenda. 
Um, what we've done is we've split the report into two. Uh, the first part being the operating income and expenditure, the second being the RWS phase two development expenditure budget. Um, that budget is reporting against the reforecast that was approved by council in August. Uh, page 58 goes through the key expenditure for the month. Um, and it's important to note that uh, everything is on track at the moment in terms of, for the RWS, in terms of uh, the budgetary forecast that was approved in, in August. There's nothing to uh, report there in terms of any overspends. So um, most of the details set out there, so happy to take any questions if there are any. Question around the EPA process, given that um, this is into the High Court and it is a challenge around legal aspects of the plan change, not around the consent. I take it this, and um, given that we've um, looked at the figures that have been um, approved in our own budget of 62,000, for that, that this 29,000 relates to the plan change as it would affect the operation of the consents, is that right? The appeal is against the consents as well as against the plan change. In one case. In one case, yeah. Which case is that? Forest Oh, okay, yep, thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Belford. <coughs> uh, yeah, this, these numbers uh, on page 59 are always presented as phase two development expenditure. Uh, can you remind me, that the, there's another Five million phase three and a half, one? Three and a half million. Three and a half million? That's correct. Yeah. Thank you. Which, just for clarity, is in the council's books, um, or was in the council's books, and is included, you know, is, is matched in ours by the price of purchasing the intellectual property and so on at the end of phase one, which was the feasibility study. Right, thank you. Any other questions? Any questions? Some question. Just for the record here, there's been a, a few days of correspondence here regarding um, my agitation for the legal uh, review of this by uh, Stuart Webster, and I just want to uh, get into the record here that the, the current understanding is that that uh, based on this last exchange is that he would be invited to attend either the Corporate and Strategic Committee or the Council meeting in November uh, to provide the legal review that we've been asking for? Absolutely, or, or, or in writing. Might be better in writing. I mean, he's been out of the country, my understanding. Back today. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Right. 9.30 in the morning. Okay, no further Chairman, questions. Chairman, if I can just um, add to that. And so if there are questions that need to be addressed as a consequence of that legal review, then obviously we will be happy to pass that through to our legal and financial advisors in relation to this, this document um, and we'll, to the water user agreement. And you know, we'll keep going around that discussion. Very useful. Okay. You're happy to move, Councillor Dick. Thank you for that. We have a second. Uh, Thank you. Oh, Councillor Belford seconds that. Uh, you wish to speak? Councillor Belford. Further speakers? Uh, Councillor Grant. The value uh, around this investment is in the water user agreement. Without that, you have a big lake. Or, and as a comparison, you have a skyscraper without tenants. And the value of the water use agreement is in the security. And I'm personally still not convinced that it's adequate. So I look forward to talking to Stuart Webster. I can be convinced, but right now, I'm not. Okay. Councillor Scott. I would just like to um, thank um, the Chairman and the um, Chief Executive, for, for this update on, on this, has been a very interesting conversation. What has impressed me is the degree of work that has been done on the footprint and the impact of the footprint. And I think that when we go into some of the detail of the work that's coming out of this, then it gives us confidence as to the way it's being managed. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. No further discussion. You wish to sum up, Councillor Day? With, with your microphone, perhaps. 
appreciate uh, Councillor Graham's concerns, but I actually believe that um, structured as a, a utility with essentially as a monopoly supplier, supplier um, the provisions that are in there and the safeguards that exist, the incentives for um, water users to keep using water are such that uh, the future revenue streams, I believe, uh, have a high level of safeguard. Thank you. Well, I'll put the motion in. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. Carried. Thank you, gentlemen.